Hi guys, today we will discuss a very important topic that is the anatomy of the male reproductive system. This is Dr. Yusuf signing from Al Jof University. To begin with, the male genital system or the reproductive system consists of the testis which is the main primary organ in the male reproductive system. Then apart from that, the vas difference or it is also called as the ductus difference. Then we have the seminal vesicles, ejaculatory duct. All these form the, the main uh, structures for the uh, male reproductive system or it is also called as the male genital system. So here you can see here. So this is the testis here. Then we have the vas difference is the duct which will be conducted from the epididymis and then we have the seminal vesicles as well as the ejaculatory duct all these form the main primary organs for the male reproductive system but the primary organ will be the testis then apart from that there are accessory sex organs or sex glands which will be secreting uh, some secretions which will be added into the the ejaculatory duct okay so this uh, these accessory glands will be the prostate as well as the bulbourethral gland. Prostate will be just below the bladder here. If you can see here, this is the prostate through which the urethra will be passing. So this is the prostate as well as small glands will be there on either side. Those are called the bulbourethral glands. Then we have the male external genitalia which will be seen from outside. One is the, the penis itself which is the main copulatory organ in case of the males and apart from that the bag which will be containing the testis that is called as the scrotum. These are two uh, structures or the organs which are called as the male external genitalia. So the, this is how it will be differentiated. So the main reproductive system consists of the male genital system where we have the testis, the vas different seminal vesicles as well as the ejaculatory duct. Then we have the accessory glands uh, which will be secreting the juices. Those are called as the prostate as well as the bulbourethral gland. Then we have the male external genitalia which consists of the penis as well as the scrotum. So today we'll be mainly talking about the male genital system, that to the main structure, the primary structure in the male reproductive system that is called as the testis. So uh, this uh, testis is the plural form and if it becomes TES, TIS, then it is singular. So because we have a pair of testis, so it is uh, 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 always denoted by the TES, TES. If not, if it is a single one, then you have to mention it as T-E-S-T-I-S. -E okay, so I have put it in the bracket so that you can differentiate between the singular and plural of the, the testis. Uh, to begin with, as you know, uh, the testis are a pair of uh, male reproductive uh, organs or they are also called as the male gonads. And these are present within or suspended within the scrotum by a cord that is called as the spermatic cord. So this is the testis here suspended within the scrotum. The scrotum has not been shown here, but it will be uh, suspended within a bag of the, uh, the uh, a bag which is called as the scrotum and it is suspended from above by a cord. This is called as the spermatic cord. Okay. So if you see the uh, both the testis in the right as well as the right left side the left testis is a centimeter below the the right testis so that right testis is higher up compared to the left side so you should not think this is abnormal this is the normal position the left testis is slightly below and the right testis is slightly higher up as well as it is tilted forwards as well as laterally the measurements of this testis is the testis is a small uh, male uh, gonad which is almost 5 centimeters in length the total length will be 5 centimeters and the breadth, breadth as well as the thickness are almost uh, same uh, uh, 3 centimeters in breadth as well as 3 centimeters in the, the thickness so this is the whole diameter of the the uh, testis 5 centimeters in length then it is almost 3 centimeters in breadth as well as the 3 centimeters in thickness. Uh, coming to weight, the weight is almost from 10 grams to 40 grams. It is a very small organ uh, with uh, uh, a very light weighted organ, almost 10 to 14 grams or so. Coming to the parts, uh, 
uh, the, uh, the test is just like that of the ovary it has two ends two borders as well as the two surfaces so there are two ends two borders and two surfaces so as you can see here there is an upper end as well as a lower end in the uh, practical examination during viva they might give you a test test along with the attached spermatic cord so and they might ask you to identify the side of the testis so identification of the testis is very important whether it belongs to the right side and left side and there are some features with which you should be able to identify okay so what are those one is uh, you have to identify the upper end and the lower end so how do you identify the upper end one is by the presence of the head of the epididymis this is the epididymis which is present in the posterior border so this is how you can identify the posterior border wherever the epididymis is are there that is called as the posterior border and the head of the epididymis is on the the upper part of the posterior border so it is in the upper end so uh, uh, this is the the head the epididymis has three part the head the body and the tail and from tail will be the beginning of the the adductus difference or the vas difference so you can easily differentiate between the head and the tail so wherever the adductus difference or the vas difference will be conducted that will be called as the, uh, the tail end okay and the spermatic cord will be attached toward the upper end so this is also a feature with which you can identify the um, side of the uh, uh, the testis okay so this is the the upper end Okay, so upper end can be identified by the head of the epididymis as well as if, if you see, if you lift this head, there will be different ductules. We will see the uh, different ductules in the next picture where these different ductules will be draining actually uh, the sperms which are formed in the testes into the epididymis. They will be pushed through this uh, different ductules. There will be multiple ductules. It is not a single duct, but multiple ductules will be there. Okay, so that is how we can identify the, uh, the head. Apart from that, there are some uh, 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 remnants which can be seen one is called as the the uh, the appendices of the uh, 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 epididymis as well as the appendix of the testis so these two can be seen at the upper end so we can see the appendix of the epididymis as well as the appendix of the testis so because the uh, appendix of the epididymis is more than one so they are called as appendix okay so this is how we can identify the the uh, the upper end then the upper lower end as i said the tail of the uh, the epididymis will be at the lower end as well as uh, the the uh, the ductus difference will be, begin from the tail of the uh, epididymis so that is how you can identify the the tail of the epididymis as well as the lower end of the testis and the tail of epididymis uh, by it is attached uh, to this uh, uh, the by areola tissue and the tunica vaginis to the lower end okay coming to the borders if you as i said the posterior border will be occupied by the epididymis it will be posterior as well as slightly lateral okay so that is how you can identify the posterior border anterior border is smooth as well as convex as you can see in this picture so it is uh, the it is smooth as well as convex the posterior border because of the occupation by the the epididymis it is much more broader as well as flat and as i said uh, the um, it will be occupied by the the uh, epididymis mainly and even the the spermatic cord will be attached to the uh, upper end near the posterior board okay so this is how you can identify the anterior border you can differentiate between anterior border and the posterior board and the third important feature is two surfaces which are those surfaces one is medial and the other is lateral so the medial surface will be smooth and convex and it will be much more free but the lateral surface is convex smooth as well as epididymis as i said it is not only on the posterior border but it is slightly lateral also the epididymis the head body and the tail so you can uh, say that the epididymis is on the posterior lateral side so this should be slightly lateral okay so the uh, if you see these uh, the medial surface it will be smooth as well as it is free as well as convex okay so this is how you can identify so you should be able to identify or differentiate between the upper border and the lower border and then we have to identify differentiate between the two surfaces the medial surface 
which is almost free and the lateral surface which will be occupied posteriorly by the epididymis then the borders anterior border which is smooth as well as convex as well as free the posterior border is broad flat as well as occupied by the epididymis okay so these are some of the features with which you can differentiate between the the uh, the two ends two borders and two surfaces as well as you can identify these uh, two borders two uh, surfaces as well as two ends and differentiate between the right side and the left side of the uh, testes okay Uh, to begin with about the epididymis as we have said already uh, so it, this is a comma shaped structure if you can see here it looks like a comma comma in english we have the full stop and comma it looks like a comma and uh, it has three parts as we have already seen the head the body as well as the tail and this is uh, formed by a single duct even though it looks like a thick uh, band of thing it is nothing but the coiling of the single duct of the epididymis which differentiate itself into the head body and the tail okay and uh, this is called as uh, the duct of the canal of the epididymis and this uh, epididymis is a very important uh, structure which will be storing the sperm for some time and the final maturation of the sperms will be taking place in the epididymis so this uh, is called as uh, the the uh, uh, capacitation of the uh, as well as the spermiogenesis okay so mainly it will be the capacitation of the sperm that is the mortality of the sperms uh, will be gained uh, in the uh, 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 in the uterus as well as uh, in the uh, the head of as well as the body and the tail okay the final maturation of the sperms which will be the spermiogenesis mainly and the capacitation is mainly taking place in the the uterus where it, they become actually motile okay so the uh, this is a very important part where uh, the final maturation of the sperms will be taking place and that's why it will be stored for some time till it is uh, uh, pushed into the vas deferens and from there it will be uh, ejaculated outside okay so this is about the the epididymis so it as i said it has an head body and a tail the head can be identified by the presence of these are the different ductules which i said which are coming from the testes they begin from the testes and they will be draining the the uh, the sperms into the uh, the head of the epididymis so this is how you can identify the presence of the different ductules here if you lift the head then you can see these different ductules then we have something called as the the appendices which we have seen these are nothing but the degenerated part of the mesonephros which will be seen here as we saw in the previous picture okay those are called as the appendices of the uh, epididymis these are nothing but the uh, the degenerated part or the uh, the remnants of the uh, mesonephros so i repeat uh, that uh, the spermiogenesis will be taking place in the the epididymis that is the final maturation of the sperms uh, to become motile but actual uh, motility will be gained in the uterus uh, by a method called as the capacitation okay so spermiogenesis will be taking place in the epididymis and the capacitation will be taking place once the, the sperms are released into the uterus okay uh, so this is about the uh, the sperms as well as the epididymis now going to the the coverings of the scrotum how the testes are covered so how they are hanging within the scrotum scrotum is nothing but a, a bag of a skin bag with a lot of membranes and uh, uh, muscles deep inside so we'll try to identify so how uh, this bag will be containing the uh, the testes so deep inside here is the testes so outside we have the first layer is the skin so this is the skin Uh, which will be uh, forming the the bag inside that we have a a subcutaneous uh, uh, muscle subcutaneous muscle this is called as the dorsus muscle this is a very typical muscle which will be just like the subcutaneous muscle in the neck which is called as the platysma similarly we have a subcutaneous muscle here that is, this is called as the dorsus muscle this is deep just deep, deep to the the skin then inside that we have a fascia this is called as the the external spermatic fascia Ex external spermatic fascia this 
is not only uh, it is extending from the cord so this forms not only the covering of the cord but also it extends into the scrotum okay this is called as the external spermatic fascia this blue line then deep to that there is uh, this is coming from the uh, the uh, external oblique muscle of the abdomen okay so this is the external spermatic fascia deep to that there is a muscle here deep inside in the abdomen which is called as the cremastric muscle or the cremaster and that will be extending uh, 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 to some extent as well as it continues as a fascia this is called as the cremat cremastic fascia so uh, the deep to that the fourth layer will be the cremastic muscle as well as the fascia mainly the fa muscle will be in the uh, actually in the uh, the lower part of the abdomen and it extends uh, up to a certain extent as the muscle then it continues as the fascia this is called as the cremastic muscle as well as the fascia deep to that there is one more important fascia which is coming as a fascia from the abdomen uh, this is the internal spermatic fascia so this is the internal sp spermatic fascia so the first one is the outside we have the skin then we have the daughter's muscle then we have the external spermatic fascia then we have the cremastic muscle as well as the fascia then we have the internal spermatic fascia and finally we have a, a thin uh, layer of the peritoneum which hangs like a bag and this has two layers the parietal and visceral layer this bag is called as the the tunica vaginalis and it will be having two layers the parietal layer form the part of the scrotum and it, uh, the visceral layer will form the part of the the testis itself so that will be the the sixth layer so there are six layers uh, which will be forming a bag within which will be the the testis so this is the scrotum from outside to inside the layers are the skin then we have the daughter's muscle instead of the superficial fascia and deep fascia we have a muscle here subcutaneous muscle that is called as daughter's muscle then deep to that we have the the external spermatic fascia then uh, we have the then deep to that we have the cremastic fascia as well as the muscle then we have the internal spermatic fascia then the parietal layer of the tunica vaginalis so these are the coverings of the the scrotum so this is how it looks like so all these are the different layers of the scrotum now going to the the coverings of the testis so this testis is covered again by three layers or they are also called as the capsules because they are covering from outside so they form the capsule or they are the three coverings or they are also called as the three intrinsic covering because it is covering the test itself deep inside okay so these are the first is the the visceral layer of the tunica vagina we have seen the parietal layer which form the the uh, layer the uh, innermost layer of the scrotum then we have the visceral layer if you can see here in this picture so here this is the tunica vaginis this is the parietal layer and this is the visceral layer and in between is the cavity so it is part of the peritoneum which uh, uh, remains as a cavity and the upper part will be closed okay uh, so this is uh, so this becomes a separate cavity with a parietal layer and visceral layer parietal layer will be forming the the innermost layer of the scrotum and the visceral layer will form the uh, the covering of the testis itself so this uh, visceral layer of the tunica vaginalis will be forming the uh, the first layer outermost covering of the testis and this covers not only the testis but it goes around even covering the epididym itself okay so it covers all the surfaces and borders except the posterior border because the posterior border as we have already seen is occupied by the epididymis so it covers the epididymis uh, leaving the posterior border okay so this is the first layer this is called as uh, the the tunica uh, vagina uh, this is the uh, the tunica uh, this is the tunica uh, vaginalis and deep to that we have next layer that is called as uh, the tunica albuginea tunica albuginea so this is the tunica albuginea this is nothing but a uh, layer of thick uh, uh, fibrous tissue which is whitish in color that is that's why it is called as albuginea albuginea means whitish tunica is the layer so white layer which is covering the testis uh, this will form uh, this is called as a tunica uh, vaginalis uh, tunica albuginea after the tunica vaginalis deep inside we have the tunica albuginea which covers the whole of the testis and this will be giving uh, some septas okay 
and these septas will divide the whole of the testis into lobes okay or it is also called as the lobules so this will be giving septas from the anterior surface it will be giving septas lot of septas and it will divide the whole of the testis into almost 200 to 300 cone shaped uh, lobules here okay so these are the cone shaped lobules which are almost 200 to 300 in number and these are formed by the the uh, the imagination of the tunic albuginal you know, deep inside the structure of the testis and in the posterior border it will uh, be forming a uh, incompletely divided partition that is called as the mediastine of the testis here will be the mediastine of the testis it is undivided but here uh, the uh, the anterior border will be giving or the anterior surface will be giving lot of septas and it will divide the whole of the testis into 200 to 300 lobules then it is also consisting even though it is fibrous in nature uh, there may, might be small quantity of muscle fibers which are very sparsely present and what is the importance of this uh, uh, muscle fibers uh, whenever they contract they help in the release of the secretion that is the 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 form the sperms which are formed in the uh, here, here in the lobules will be released into the the uh, uh, the mediastine of the testis okay and then uh, we have the innermost layer which will be within these each uh, lobule and this is called as uh, the tunica vasculosa because it is highly vascular which will be giving nourishing these uh, seminiferous tubules these are the seminiferous tubules which are called here so they have to be provided with huge quantity of nutrition lot of blood that's why uh, this innermost layer which is uh, highly vascular layer that is called as uh, the tunia, tunica vasculosa okay so uh, these are the coverings of the uh, the testis outside we have the tunica vaginalis with the visceral layer then deep to that with the tunica albuginea which will be dividing the testis into uh, 200 to 300 lobules and in the posterior border they don't divide and there will be a thick band of this fibrous tissue that will form the mediastinum testis and the seminiferous tubules will form rete testis here these are the seminiferous tubules which will come here and they uh, connect with each other and they form a network like thing that will be called as the rete testis and uh, the, this uh, layer of the tunica albuginea also consists of small quantity of uh, muscle fibers which help in the uh, uh, contraction of these lobules and release of the the uh, uh, sperms maturing sperms into the rete testis then we have the uh, innermost layer that is called as uh, the tunica vasculosa which will be lining individual lobules which will be highly vascular and it will be providing the nutrition for this uh, the uh, the formation of the uh, the spermatogenesis so these these are some of the coverings of the testis now coming to the the structure of the testis we have already studied some of the macroscopic features we will study more of this macroscopic features before we go to the microscopic so this as we have already seen the tunica uh, albuginea will be dividing the whole of the testis into 200 to 300 lobules and these uh, 200 to 3 lob uh, 300 lobules will contain 1 to 3 seminiferous tubules each of these uh, lobules will have 1 to uh, 3 seminiferous tubules and in between there will be uh, interstitial cells of leading we'll see where exactly they are present uh, in when we see the microscopic picture uh, these seminiferous tubules which are highly coiled if they are stretched if they are stretched then they become almost each uh, seminiferous tubules will be almost 2 feet or 70 to 80 centimeters and they are as you can see in this picture they are highly convoluted as well as um, when they come out they come out and they form a plexus uh, in the mediastinum of the testis then uh, this plexus is called uh, the rete testis so here also you can see in the for simplification they have only shown each uh, lobule with one single seminiferous tubule which is highly coiled and it comes out into the mediastinum and they form the rete testis and from this rete testis around 12 to 20 different ductules will be beginning and they will go to the and they form the head of the epididymis 
So these are the efferent ductules which are beginning from the rated testes almost 12 to 20 efferent ductules and they go to the, the head end of the epididymis and they form the head of the epididymis. Later they all join to form a single duct and that will be the called as the duct of the epididymis. It will be single but it will be highly coiled and it will be forming the body as well as the tail. So a single duct here uh, it is single duct which will be highly coiled and this will be forming the body and the tail and if you stretch this if this almost becomes 20 feet approximately and apart from that there can be also the superior and inferior aberrant ductules which can be uh, seen these are nothing but the the remnants of the the uh, mesonephric duct also called as the ulfian duct okay uh, so these are some of the features which you can see uh, macroscopically Coming to the microscopic features, in microscopic feature, this the section shown, which is nothing but the the uh, the uh, the uh, the seminiferous uh, the tubule, which will be uh, seen already. We have seen these are the seminiferous tubules. The same has been shown uh, a single one for the simplification. So. So this is nothing but the cut section of the seminiferous tubule. Okay, uh, so seminiferous tubules are the main structures where the sperms are formed. And these seminiferous tubules, this is a single one of it. And this in within this uh, seminiferous tubule, we can see two uh, kinds of uh, or two varieties of cells. One are the spermati uh, spermatogenic cells as well as the other are the uh, supporting cells. The spermatogenic cells are the cells which are forming the, uh, the spermatogenesis that is which are helping in the formation of sperms and there are uh, some cells which help in support. These are called, uh, there are specific cells here, these are called uh, the cells of Sertoli or Sertolic cells. So there are two types of cells, one is the spermatogenic cells from which the sperms are formed and there are other type of cells which are helping in this spermatogenesis. Okay, so these are the two types of cells which can be seen and outside this, uh, the seminiferous tubules, these are covered by the basement membrane. This is the basement membrane which is there and inside we have two types of cells and uh, within this uh, spermatogenic cells, as they are maturing, the most uh, immature cells will be toward the basement membrane and the most mature cells will come toward the, the, uh, the uh, lumen near the center. Okay, so the most uh, primitive cells uh, of the spermatogenic cells E and B type will be here. Then we have the, the spermatids in the middle and uh, as they mature further they will be coming deep inside here. So there are three ill-defined uh, areas, one are the outermost intermediate as well as the, the uh, inner layer. Okay, so this is the outermost, this is the intermediate as well as this is the inner. So the primitive sex cells as well as the spermatogonia, primary spermatocytes, secondary spermatocytes, spermatids as well as the spermatozoa. These are the, here all the spermatozoa will be uh, the um, almost uh, in the nearing of the mature cell. They are the spermatozoa cells which will be at the lumen. Okay, um, but the final maturation as I said it will be when they go into the epididymis. Okay. So this final maturation will be taking place as I said by a process called as the spermiogenesis where the spermatids are uh, metamorphosed into mature spermatozoa without further cell division. This is the most important. Here there might be cell division taking place but here once they become the, uh, the mature, uh, once they go into the mature spermatozoa then they don't divide. So that process where they gain the final maturation that is called as the spermiogenesis. Okay, so here will be the most primitive cells, primitive sex cells as well as the spermatogonia A as well as B. Then they transfer themselves into the primary uh, as well as the secondary spermatocytes. Then we have the spermatids here, then the spermatozoa deep inside. So the spermiogenesis should be differentiated from the spermatogenesis. Spermatogenesis is the whole maturation of the sperms from the primitive sex cells to the, the spermatozoo uh, that is called as spermatogenesis. 
and the final maturation is called as spermiogenesis so it should be able to differentiate be between the spermiogenesis as well as the spermatogenesis spermatogenesis is the whole process of maturation of the spermatogenic tissue from the uh, type a cells which will be here to the spermatozoa so here you can see this is a much more clear picture showing the different types of cells which finally form the mature cells so here will be the primitive sex cells as well as the the spermatogonia a as well as the uh, the spermatogonia type b then they become the the uh, the primary as well as secondary spermatocytes then here will be the spermatids and the spermatozoa will be deep inside so these are divided into the outermost layer intermediate layer and the innermost layer okay so these are the spermatogenic cells so apart from that there are supporting cells which are those the sartori cells so in this picture if you can see here uh, between these uh, spermatogenic cells inside we can see a big cell here these are called as sartori cells here there is one more this is the sartori cells here all is one more this is the sartori cell these are whitish cells which are shown here in this picture so these are called are the sartori cell these are the supporting cells so these are elongated elongated cells as you can see here they are from the basement up to the almost toward the lumen so these are elongated as well as polyhedral cells and extend from the basement membrane to the seminiferous tubules to the lumen of the seminiferous tubule as you can see in this picture okay so these have the capacity to bind tightly with each other uh, each other so they are binding to each other tightly so they form tight junctions here in between and this is very important because outside this basement membrane we have blood vessels here so this tight junctioning of the sartoli cells will help in the formation of blood testis barrier a very important barrier uh, which will prevent the the uh, blood cells from entering uh, into the the uh, the mature uh, into the the uh, uh, seminiferous tubules itself as well as coming in contact with the these maturing cells okay so if this is broken down then it leads to formation of something called as the anti spermatic uh, spermic uh, antibodies this is uh, seen in those people who are uh, sterile males so in those if you see uh, there will be formation of the anti anti spermic antibody so these are the uh, anti to the the uh, the sperms so they uh, fight with the sperms and they broke down the the process of the spermatogenesis so those are called as the anti spermic antibodies which will be formed if this barrier is broken so this barrier which is formed by the sartori cells which is called as the uh, blood test is barrier is very important here they have shown it as the test is blood barrier so this is the barrier uh, which is formed by the tight junction of the sartori cells and a very important thing happens within this sperm uh, the sartori cells they not only form the tight junction but uh, as well as they not only uh, form supporting cells but also if you see these maturing sperms will be invaginating especially uh, the maturing sp sperms will be in invaginating into these cells and they uh, actually mature as well as get nutrition through these supporting cells of sartori so the spermatids invaginate into the sartori cells and mature they invaginate within the cells and then they get the nutrition and they start maturing so the function of the uh, the sartori cells is a very important component that is providing of nutrition to this maturing uh, uh, sperm spermatogenic cells okay so these spermatogenic cells maturing spermatogenic cells will be getting nutrition all the nutrition for the growth uh, through this sartori cells as well as the metabolic waste products are thrown into this sartori cells and they eat up and go the the metabolic waste product so the exchange of nutrition and metabolic uh, uh, will be taking place by these sartori cells the second is they help in protecting the uh, the sperm cells from the uh, from immunity as you can see here because they form the blood testis barrier so the immunity developing against these cells will be prevented 
and the formation of the anti-spermic antibodies will be prevented so this is a very important okay. they not only provide uh, the nutrition as well as remove the metabolites uh, as well as not only protect but also they give uh, additional support by forming a blood test barrier okay and prevent the immunity as well as they also have the capacity uh, to phagocyte the the residual body if there's some of the cells die they will be phagocyte that is they will be engulfing this dead material and okay so that is called uh, the uh, phagocytosis and they have the capacity to eat up engulf these uh, residual bodies from the uh, the uh, whole of the the uh, uh, somniferous tubules and it has been studied and it has been reported that these uh, the supporting cells of sertoli are very important for the development of the uh, the whole uh, journey of the spermatogenesis so it is necessary for the proper development of these uh, the spermatogenic cells as well as even in the function of the fsh uh, the follicle stimulating hormone the testosterone androgen binding proteins all these um, uh, form a important component and uh, this is also seen that these uh, sertoli cells they don't divide um, during the reproductive life whatever division has to be taken place and whatever number of sertoli cells to be formed they will be uh, done before in very young uh, uh, age and by the reproductive life when in, by the teenage life uh, these sertoli cells uh, they stop dividing themselves and also it has been studied that uh, they are resistant to infection so uh, these cells are very resistant to infection so it is good for the again for the uh, spermatogenesis okay so these are some of the functions of the sertoli cells even though they are just seen as supporting cell but they have a lot of functions okay they provide nutrition they remove the waste metabolites they form a test uh, blood test barrier they prevent the immunity from uh, forming as well as they help in division of the cells as well as uh, they get all the nutrition as well as uh, the uh, regular uh, hormonal exchanges all these will be uh, uh, done in a proper way by the sertoli cells as well as they are very resistant to infection so they prevent infection itself okay so these are some of the functions of the sertoli cells coming to the other type of cells those are called as the interstitial cells of the leading so these are called as the interstitial cells because they are present in the interstitial uh, area between the somniferous tubules this is one somniferous tubule shown here there will be one one again there will be multiple as we have seen each lobule will be having uh, two to three semiferous tubules and and they will be coiled so they will come across many of those uh, coiled semiferous tubules together so there will be multiple here and in between there is the interstitial fascia and within that will be the the polyhedral cells these are uh, polyhedral in uh, shape so these are called as the interstitial cells and these are have a specific name these are called as cells of leading so they are called as interstitial cells of leading and as i said they are present uh, uh, associated within the lobule as well as the ex uh, external to the semiferous tubules so yeah, as you can see they are present between the semiferous tubules and within the lobule okay so we have seen the lobules they are 200 to 300 so within those lobules they are present as well as they are present outside the semiferous tubules not inside but the sertoli cells are present inside the semiferous tubules uh, that is the difference between the interstitial cells of Redick and semiferous tubules. There are other important thing, uh, uh, features. Uh, it is seen that these interstitial cells of Redick, uh, they are more uh, during the fetal life, but later they disappear for unknown reason uh, during uh, childhood, but they reappear at puberty. This is how it has been observed. So they are seen in the fetal life but they are not seen in the childhood they disappear in the childhood but reappear at puberty and they will be present after that throughout their life and these uh, uh, interstitial cells of Lydig are regulated in fetal life by the placental gonadotrophins 
and in case of uh, after puberty it will be uh, maintained by the interstitial cells uh, of the ICSH of the anti-puberty so that is the interstitial cell stimulating hormone ICSH of the anti-puberty and these are rich in it has been observed they are rich in vitamin C as well as they have a lot of lipid droplets as well as cholesterol within them and the main function of these uh, interstitial cells of lydic is they secrete testosterone a very important hormone the male hormone uh, which will be secreted by the interstitial cells of leading so this is the hormone which will give the all the male features so this uh, interstitial cells of leading will be secreting the testosterone and this uh, it has also been uh, uh, found that they will be probably secreting the estrogen and this testosterone which is produced in the uh, uh, fetal life because they are present in the fetal life so uh, these uh, testosterone secreted by these interstitial cells of lady during fetal life because there is no at that time there is no actually uh, formation of uh, features of male features so they actually help in the descent of the testis so this uh, uh, secretion of the interstitial cells of leading which will be secreting the testosterone help in the descent of the testis uh, throughout their life and by birth the testis will be in the scrotum so that's why uh, the interstitial cells of leading are important during fetal life also and once uh, again they appear in the puberty they will be helping in the secondary sex character in case of the male that is the growing of the beard mustache and other features broad chest and other things okay so these are some of the functions of the interst interstitial cells of leading okay now coming to the blood supply of the testis the arterial supply of the testis is by the testicular artery which is a direct branch beginning from the abdominal aorta so this is the testicular artery which is supplying the testis point to be noted is even though the organs uh, which are above the testis which are in the pelvis even in the lower part of abdomen they are supplied by the uh, the common iliac or external iliac or the internal iliac but why the testis which is below the abdomen below the pelvic organs which is in the scrotum this is supplied by the uh, uh, the testicular artery which is a direct branch from the abdominal aorta for this you have to uh, study the development of the testis where uh, if you see the initial development of the testis it is actually the testis will be in the abdomen it is an abdominal organ later it start descending into the pelvis and from there into the scrotum so when it descends it will be uh, keeping its uh, arterial supply which is directly from the the uh, abdominal aorta so that's why even though this testis is in the scrotum it will be directly supplied by the the testicular artery similarly in case of the female the ovary is also a abdominal organ which is in the beginning of the uh, development of the fetus it will be in the abdomen uh, it descends into the pelvis it will not descend like uh, in case of the male into the scrotum but it will descend into up to the pelvis and uh, it remains there so when uh, the arterial supply of the uh, the ovary will be also from the direct branch coming from the the abdominal aorta so that will be called as the ovarian artery so this is the main artery which is supplying the testis this is called as the testicular artery and you should rem remember that it is a branch directly coming from the abdominal aorta apart from this uh, testicular artery it is also supplied partially by the the artery to the vas deferens uh, as well as the cremastic artery so the artery to the vas deferens is from the superior as well as inferior vesicular artery and the cremastic artery is from the inferior epigastric artery so uh, this is the arterial supply of the testis coming to the venous drainage venous drainage of the testis is by a plexus of veins uh, which is called as pampaniform plexus this is similar to that of the pampaniform plexus which is around the ovary in case of the female so this is a plexus of veins uh, which anastomose with each other and they form a plexus of almost 15 to 20 uh, veins around the testis 
as well as even to some extent into the, the spermatic cord and they start uh, initially they will be forming a lot of network and then they will all join together to form four veins at around the superficial inguinal ring and by the time they enter into the deep inguinal ring they have already two okay and finally uh, the two veins join together to form a singular single vein and which will be called as the testicular vein and the typical feature of this testicular vein is on the right side it will be draining directly into the inferior vena cava but on the left side it will be draining into the left renal vein and from there into the inferior vena cava so in the right side it will be draining at an angle of 30 degree and at the left side it will be draining at an angle of 90 degree to the left renal vein this is very important clinically because uh, sometimes uh, because this is draining at an angle of 90 degree so there is a lot of back pressure and if there is a loss of competency of the valves within the veins then uh, there will be backflow of blood and especially on the left side it is observed that uh, the uh, there is varicosity of the vein so in case of the test it is called as the varicocele so uh, if you uh, see a patient with varicocele you feel like a bag of worms within the scrotum so it looks like as though there are a bag of worms within the, uh, the testis. So this is called uh, the varicocele uh, and this is observed that it is more common on the left side than on the right side. It is more common on, common on the left, left side because it is draining at an angle of 90 degree. So which leads to lot of pressure to be uh, exerted to push the venous blood back into the inferior cava. But on the right side because it is at an angle of uh, 30 to 40 degree so it can easily drain into the inferior vena cava so clinically this is very important and you should know why it is more common on, on the left side than on the right side <clears throat> so as i said the uh, on the right side the uh, right testicular vein directly drains into the inferior vena cava but on the left side it will be draining into the left renal vein and this angle is very important 90 degree because that is the angle which make all the difference <clears throat> And why there should be a plexus of veins around this uh, testis? This is very important. Again, this is because uh, this has the capacity because there is a plexus of veins and the scrotum is outside the body. So, uh, and uh, always the for the spermatogenesis, the temperature uh, uh, required will be lower than that of the body temperature, almost four degree lower than the body temperature. And this is uh, important. And that's why this plexus of vein help in the absorption of the uh, heat and this help in the counter current heat exchange. So because of the plexus of vein, which are external outside the body in the scrotum, so they easily uh, cool down the testes and decrease the, uh, the uh, temperature of the testes compared to the body level. <coughs> Coming to the lymphatic drainage, uh, the lymphatic drainage is into the pre and parioptic group of lymph nodes. Now again you know why because even though it is in the below the pelvis in the scrotum but still the lymphatic drainage is into the the pre and parioptic group of lymph nodes because as you know it has descended from the abdomen into the the pelvis and they from into the scrotum. Okay so that's why the lymphatic drainage is uh, into the pre and parioptic. Here are the the uh, this is the air tab behind, and here are the pre and as well as the on the lateral sub lateralic group of lymph nodes. Coming to the nerve supply, it is by the the autonomic nervous system as you know by the renal as well as the uh, the aortic plexuses which are supplying them also supplies uh, the uh, uh, the test itself. Okay. And the preganglionic are uh, from the T10 and the 11th thoracic segment and this is important again whenever there is pain in the, uh, the testis it is referred to the umbilical region. This is because of the, the level at which uh, the preganglion fibers are supplying from. So it is from the 10th and 11th thoracic segment. It is same as that of the, the region supplied, uh, the skin supplied by the, the segmental innervation of the umbilicus. Okay, so it is T10 to T11. So the pain which starts from the, uh, the scrotum, which is very much below, uh, even though it, the pain is in the testis, it will be referred into the uh, near the umbilical region. Okay. 
coming to the development uh, will not go into de details about the development because it needs a separate chapter so here just will mention the three sources from where it will be uh, developing so the medulla uh, of the uh, genital ridge uh, is from the proliferation of the coelomic epithelium at the seventh intrauterine life as well as the, the primitive sex cells will be coming from the dorsal hindgut and uh, the canalization of the testis as well as the retic uh, cord actually there will be solid structures later there will be canalization again all these changes will be taking at the seventh month of intrauterine life uh, the different tactiles of the testes are from the, the mesonephric tubules which are the persistent uh, part of the mesonephric tubules and the, uh, the epididymis as well as vast difference especially the canal of the epididymis as well as the vast difference all these are formed from the mesonephric duct most of the, uh, the, uh, the structures of the epididymis vast difference all these are formed from the, the uh, male duct that is the mesonephric duct also called as the Ulfian duct. Now briefly about the, the descent of the testis, how exactly it will be taking place. Uh, so actually as I said these testis as well as even in case of the female it will the ovaries uh, together we can call as the gonads will be in the abdomen in the upper part of the abdomen and they later they start descending in case of female they will come up to the pelvis and they will stay there but in case of the male it goes up to the scrotum so this will begin uh, at a very early stage and by the fourth month it has already reached the iliac fossas okay so this is the testis at the uh, an early stage and then it has descended by the fourth month into the uh, iliac fossa and by the seventh month it has already reached the deep inguinal ring if you can see here this is the testis which is almost into the uh, deep inguinal ring this is the the abdominal uh, muscles and you can see it is descending downwards and here below there is a ligament this is called as the gubernaculum so which has a very important role okay so it descend downwards and by the eighth month it has almost passed through the inguinal canal okay and by the birth or by the ninth month it will be almost into the the scrotum so it will be by the birth it will be or immediately after birth it will be uh, into the scrotum so this is uh, the whole uh, process by which the abdominal structure has descended up to the scrotum in different stages of the intrauterine life and by birth it will be almost into the uh, uh, into the uh, uh, the scrotum okay uh, when it is descending downwards it will be taking a, a part of the peritoneal fold into the scrotum itself this is called as the process vaginalis we have already seen that the process vaginalis will be covering the testis uh, the uh, the it has two parts as we have seen the parietal and visceral layer the parietal layer will form the part of the scrotum layer and the the visceral part will be forming the outermost covering for the testis so that is nothing but the a part of the peritoneum where the testis descend it will be pulling along with it into the scrotum and this becomes closed because it will be uh, totally blocked in the uh, the uh, the spermatic cord okay but sometimes it might be patent. We'll talk about that later. Okay. So uh, if we have seen during its descent below, we have seen a fibrous ligament-like structure, which will be becoming short and short. This has a very important role. This is called as the gubernaculum. Gubernaculum. So this is called as the gubernaculum testis. Uh, it is a fibromuscular band, uh, which uh, will be uh, attached proximally to the lower pole of the testis as you can see here in this picture also they are showing the testis and below this is the uh, the uh, the gubernaculum and as the testis descend downwards this becomes shorter and shorter or this becomes shorter and shorter and because of which they say that the testis has been descending downwards and along with that if you can see here there is a fold of peritoneum which is descending downwards later it becomes the tunica vaginalis and the upper part has become totally closed block and it is totally separated from the peritoneal cavity itself okay so uh, this gubernaculum is attached proximally to the lower pole of the testis and the peritoneum in front of the testis as well as the mesonephric duct mesonephric duct is that duct from which the as we have seen the the epididymis vast different seminal vesicles ejaculated duct all are formed okay 
and distally uh, the attachment of this is to the bottom of the scrotum into the perineum symphysis pubis saphenous opening as well as the anterior superior iliac spine okay so that will be this uh, splitting so what are the factors which help in the descent of the testes why the testes descend from the abdomen in the upper part of the abdomen into the the testes the exact reason is still not sure uh, not they are not sure about the exact reason okay still they don't know the uh, what exactly is causing the descent of the testes but uh, they say that the gubernaculum testis is the guiding force it will be directing even though if it is um, not a, a, a structure which will be a main structure which will be pulling at least it will be guiding force because it will be showing the direction you can see in this pictures it is directing it downwards okay and here also you can see it is showing the path exactly from where it has already sent because this gubernaculum distally it has already attached to the scrotum as well as the pelvis okay so this acts as the the guiding force as well as it also when it is seen that during the descent it widens the inguinal canal so so that the testes can easily pass through and this is also seen that the in case of the elephants this gubernaculum testis is absent and in case of the uh, uh, elephants themselves the uh, the testes are intra abdominal so these two factors in case of the elephants uh, state that gubernaculum has a very important role okay uh, because in case of the elephants the uh, there is no gubernaculum and it is uh, intra abdominal okay so that's why they come to the conclusion that uh, gubernaculum testis might be a very important factor the second important and very important factor is the intra abdominal pressure so there is huge pressure within the abdomen which might be leading to uh, the descent of the testes especially when the liver starts growing to a huge extent and as you know uh, in case of the newborn the test uh, the liver will be occupying a large part of the abdomen okay and it's keep on growing and that's why there might be a lot of pressure and which might lead to the descent of testes and the third important feature is the the temperature as i said before the testis needs a temperature which is almost 4 degrees lesser compared to that of the the uh, body temperature so because the body temperature in the abdomen is higher so that might be a important factor in descent okay uh, so this uh, 4 degree lower temperature favors the spermatogenesis because uh, this is necessary for the spermatogenesis as well as the uh, we have already seen that the plexus of veins uh, around the testis that is the pampaniform plexus help in the counter current uh, exchange of the gases uh, the temperature and it has it is also seen that we don't find no uh, no subcutaneous fat there okay instead of that there is a muscle which is called as the daughter's muscle in the subcutaneous area of the scrotum as well as the surface cooling this helps in the surface cooling there is no fat uh, to insulate it as well as uh, it is outside the abdomen uh, as well as the pelvis it is outside okay and uh, there is plexus of veins all this will help in the decrease in the temperature in the testes uh, also they say that the arch fibers of the internal oblique Uh, uh, uh might be helping in squeezing the arch fibers of the internal oblique muscle uh, this is one of the muscles of the ab uh, abdomen uh, the abdominal wall okay the abdominal wall anti abdominal wall is made up of three muscles actually there are six muscles the main three will be the external oblique internal oblique as well as transverse abdominis okay so uh, so among those the middle one the internal oblique might be helping in squeezing the the gubernaculum as well as testis itself which help in descent as well as they also say that the uncurling of the fetal carus the fetus as you know it will be totally folded in the uh, in the womb of the mother but as the uh, fetus uh, uncur uh, uh, uncurls uh, itself Uh, so that might be helping in the descent of the testis itself uh, these are all the uh, uh, the theories uh, okay but they are not exactly sure which exactly has the major role all these are some of the theories which they have put forward uh, and sixth is the internal secretion of the fetal testis itself 
okay uh, which might be the driving force because it will be as you know it will be secreting the especially the interstitial cells of uh, of leading which will be uh, present in the fetus which later disappear in childhood and again appear in the adult uh, in the teenage group so the presence of the interstitial cells which will be secreting the uh, the testosterone and other we might be a important factor in the descent of the testes so all these are some of the factors which help in the uh, uh, descent of the testes okay coming to the uh, the final part that is the the uh, anomalies of the descent if there is no descent or if there is abnormal descent what will happen so one of the most commonest will be the uh, the anarchism archi means the testis architis means inflammation of the testis anarchism means there is no testis absence of testis or it is also called as the cryptorchism cryptorchism is the more common term which will be used in this condition usually the testis is not in the scrotum but it might be found in some other places like in abdomen and uh, these if it is not in the scrotum or in if it is in somewhere else so this is the process so it might be on the way anywhere somewhere on the way so you have seen that it is intraabdominal but it passes through the deeping vein and from there to the superficial inguinal ring so it might be on the way maybe in the abdomen near the deeping vein ring or in the inguinal ring or uh, in the upper part of the scrotum so all these are the different uh, sites where you can find the this testis and descended testis okay so uh, the important feature is if it is undescended there are more chances of having uh, it developing it into malignant changes it can show malignant changes so that's why clinically it is very important cryptorchism okay the second uh, important anomaly is the monarchism where one testis is in the abdomen and the second testis is in the scrotum so one has descended and the other has not descended I, instead of both it is one has descended totally and other is in the still in the abdomen or in the on the way okay uh, so that's why uh, this is called as the monarchism mono means one single archism is the as you know the, uh, the testis and the third is the partially descended testis so as we have discussed before uh, it is partially descended it might be in the uh, the uh, abdomen it might be in the uh, deep inguinal ring superficial inguinal ring or even in the upper root of the scrotum itself or root of penis so these are all the sites where it is partially descended it has descended to certain extent but it has not completed its path so this can be if it is detected detected in a very early stage of the uh, the uh, the uh, in the, of the children then it can be treated by hormones or it is also can be done in surgically which is called as archaeopexy archaeopexy means the treatment of the testis to pull it back into normal position okay so the next one is the ectopic testis so if it is not in this path but it is in any other places apart from this regular path then it is called ectopic uh, uh, testis so here it is it is true where it is normally uh, on the path and this is the conditions where uh, it is uh, not on the path you know, somewhere else okay so it can be in the perineum in front of the symphysis pubis or it can be femoral it can be perineal or it can be in the scrotal uh, superficial ectopic and many pre uh, uh, penal that is at the root of the penis itself so all these are not in the normal path so at that time it is called as ectopic uh, testis or ectopia testis okay <coughs> next is the completely patent process vaginalis we have seen that during the descent of the testes it will be pulling a part of the peritoneum so during its descent it will be pulling a part of the peritoneum later it totally closes okay in this part the upper part okay and it is totally separated from the the peritoneal cavity sometimes this can be patent so this is condition is called as the the patent uh, tunica vaginalis okay okay so this is the patent uh, process vagina sorry this is the uh, complete patent process vagina tunica it will become tunic later okay so this is the process vaginalis which might be patent and that might be a very important cause of the congenital inguinal hernia so there might be hernias which might be congenital so these hernias uh, might be since birth 
okay so uh, these are uh, less uh, uh, chances of strangulation and other complications because these are reducible hernias which are congenital hernias and this can be corrected by surgery okay so this is because of the patent uh, process wedge analysis okay then the next one is the encysted hydrocele of this spermatic cord okay the process wedge analysis is patent in the middle and that leads to uh, a part of the process vagina is being in the form of a uh, uh, cyst or hydrocele like thing so that is called as the encysted hydrocele of the spermatic cord so uh, it is close from above as well as close from below but in the middle part it might be open as a cavity so that is becomes a cyst like so it is called an encysted okay then there might be inversion of the testis okay this in this the process vaginalis might be behind usually the process vaginalis is in the front and as we have seen the in the behind in the posterior border will be the epididymis okay so uh, usually the process vaginalis should be in the front but sometimes because of the inversion it might go behind okay so these are some of the uh, the congenital anomalies of the descent of the testis okay so if you have any doubts regarding uh, the testis or the male genital system you can definitely write to me and i will try to answer so these are my references thank you very much if you like this video just click on the like button and if you want to see more of my videos uh, similar kind of videos you can just subscribe to my channel and if you subscribe to the channels you will be getting regular updates from my channel okay thank you thank you very much